Jana Jana Saranka Su Unitam Yana Das my Shri Gana Maha. Sri Chaitanya Manobi Stam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kidam Mayam Dadati Swapadati Kam. Pande Ham Shigaro Shiuta Padakamalam Shigurum Vaishnavam Scha Shi Rupam Sagrijatam Sahagana Draganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvaduttam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitam Scha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deva Gaudavani Pacharine Nirvishesha Sunyavari Pastyatya Deva Satarine Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Iti Namine Sri Varshavana Vidavi Daite Kripa Daya Krishna Sambandha Vigyana Daine Prabhuve Namaha Madhur Ojwala Premadya Sri Rupanuka Bhakti Dasi Gauda Karuna Shakti Vigrahaya Namastate Namaste Gauravani Sri Murtaye Dina Tarine Rupanuka Virudapa Siddhanta Dvanta Harine Nama Om Gordaki Shoraya Saksad Vairagya Murtaye Vipralamba Sambo Deya Taaham Bojaya Te Namaha Namo Bhakti Veno Daya Satchidananda Bhanamine Gora Shakti Sarupaya Rupa Nuga Viraya Te Gora Vibhava Bhumi Stvam Nir Desesha Sajanat Priya Vaishnava Sarvabhoma Sri Jagannathaya Te Namaha Vanchakalpa the Rubescha Kripa Sindhu Pae Vacha Patitanam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namaha Maha Namo Maha Vadanaya Krishna Pema Padaya Te Krishna Krishna Chaitanya Namadi Gauda Triste Namaha Namo Brahmanya Devaya I'm sorry Panchatattva Makam Krishnam Bhakta Rupa Svarupa Kam Bhakta Avataram Bhakta Kyam Namami Bhakta Shakti Kam Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dinamandu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Dayatam Siddhatam Pangor Mamavanda Matirgati Matsarasya Padambo Jo Radha Madana Mohano Divya Rinda Kalpa Dumada Sri Ratna Sangara Sri Sri Radha Shila Govinda Devo Pristali Bi Sevyamana Smarami Sri Rasa Rasarambi Vamsi Vata Tatastitaha Karsan Venu Tadar Gopi Gopi Nata Te Tamaha Tapta Kanchila Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneswari Vishabhanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Pancha Kalpa Tarubhis Chati Prasindu Veva Chati Tanam Pame Vyo Vaishnavi Vyo Maho Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitana Karuna Talanda Sri Dvaita Gada Har Siva Sari Gaur Vakta Vrindam Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Jail Prabhupada Ki Jai. So we can go to one verse and the Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, first canto, chapter number 18. Verse 
nanu dvaisti kalam sam rad sarangami vasarabhukku salanasu siddhanti netrayani kritaniya Translation, Maharaj Pariksit was a realist, like the bees who only accept the essence of a flower. He knew perfectly well that in this age of Kali, auspicious things produce good effects immediately, or inauspicious acts must be actually performed in order to render effects. So he was never envious of the personality of Kali. Srila hmm. Prabhupada's purport. The age of Kali is called the fallen age. In this fallen age, because the living entities are in an awkward position, the Supreme Lord has given some special facilities to them. So by the will of the Lord, a living being does not become a victim of sinful act until the act is actually performed. In other ages, simply by thinking of performing a sinful act, one used to become a victim of the act. On the contrary, a living being in this age is awarded with the results of pious acts simply by thinking of them. And Maharaj Pariksha, being the most learned and experienced king by the grace of the Lord, was not unnecessarily envious of the personality of Kali because he did not intend to give him any chance to perform any sinful act. He protected his subjects from falling prey to the sinful acts of the age of Kali at the same time, he gave full facility to the age of Kali by allotting him some particular places. At the end of Srimad Bhagavatam, it is said that even though all nefarious activities of the personality of Kali are present, there's a great advantage in the age of Kali. One can simply, one can attain salvation simply by chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, the holy name of the Lord. Thus, Maharaj Pariksit made an organized effort to propagate the chanting of the Lord's holy name, and thus he saved the citizens from the clutches of Kali. It is for this advantage only that the great sages sometimes wish all good in the age of Kali. In the Vedas also, it is said that by discourse on the Lord's activities, one can get rid of all the disadvantages of the age of Kali. In the beginning of the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is also said, by the recitation of Srimad Bhagavatam, the Supreme Lord becomes at once arrested within one's heart. These are some of the great advantages of the age of Kali, and Maharaj Pariksha took all advantages and did not think any ill of the age of Kali, true to his Vaishnavite cult. Again, Ram Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Pastaya Bhutale, Shumati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tamande, Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavan, Krishna Nir Vishesha Sunivadi, Pasyat Yede Sitarine. Now, here is a very interesting point that's being made, a very important point, a very essential point, something we should make. Uh, a very careful note of is that the mind is the source of where the desires really formulate. Desires are coming from the heart and the heart dis distributes them to the mind and the mind contemplates them, acts on them, doesn't act on them. Well, the mind is the outlet or the incoming of everything that we come in contact with, internal and particularly here, external. So here it says that if one thinks of some negative, something negative, something inauspicious, something sinful, one does not get a reaction accordingly for that thought, wherein the age of Kali has granted that those who think in a positive way, an auspicious way, a beneficial way, a spiritual way, simply by that thought, there is uh, success. In other words, they get a they get a pious credit. They get a spiritual credit just just by thinking like that. So you can see how that relates to prayer. 
when we offer a sincere prayer for someone or when we offer a sincere prayer to the Lord, there is a movement of the material energy, which is now under the hands of the Lord, and it becomes purified by the Lord's presence, and it brings an auspicious result. So one should not think that prayer is simply words that have no result. They are very, very powerful when they are offered in the right mood, with the right intention. In other words, what is that right mood? That I want sincerely offer something to someone by praying to the Lord for the benefit of that person. We are, in other words, there is a genuine concern for the welfare of the person by giving them something that will help them in their situation or something that will, you know, benefit them in some form or another. In other words, we can pray, oh, I pray that that person uh, gets uh, the opportunity to give the Srimad Bhagavatam class. So that person may have a desire to do that. And now your prayer will help move that desire towards its fulfillment. And so prayer is very powerful. Now, the contrary here is that, and this is not the contrary, this is actually the main point of the, the verse, is that inauspicious acts or inauspicious thoughts do not have a reaction simply on the thought level. They don't, the only reaction comes when we speak it or when we perform it on the, the level of thought, there is no reaction. Where is on the, on the level of a pious or spiritual thought, one gets a, re, a, gets a benefit for that. And then the opposite, one doesn't get a negative result or a negative reaction for thinking something in that way. So that's a special concession. Why is that? Because the age of Kali is so bad. Kalir Dosha Nidhi Rajan. It's an ocean of faults. Everywhere you go, there are sinful activities. The energy is permeated with wrong energy and negative energy. Illicit sex, intoxication, meat eating, gambling, and all sinful activities permeate the atmosphere, particularly in the in the areas of the cities that we live in. When you come out to the more rural and you come out to the more forest type of areas of the world, you'll find the energy changes. And it's simply due to the fact that, you know, it's a more purifl purifying atmosphere where in the cities there is so much sinful activity going on in the name of the activities of the human being. In other words, something that is sanctioned as a way of life. And so when you walk into that atmosphere, or when you walk out of that atmosphere, in both cases, you can notice a change on how it affects you. Well, Kali Yuga is so bad, and we can use the word bad because I think it really defines this age. It's everything in this age is so bad. <laughs> Even people, when they try to become successfully materially, they are using sinful activities in order to bring about their success. Very rarely, people are pious. Well, of course, that's there also, but it's more a, and in a minority that people perform material activities in the proper way to get the result. Uh, this age is so full. Kalir Dosha Nidhi Rajan. Nidhi means ocean. And uh, Kalir means, uh, you know, uh, Kali Yuga and dosha means false. There is an ocean of faults in this age. And so even if you don't want to think of things negative, the thoughts come into your mind because of the pollution of the age. That's just the way it is. 
And you're not responsible. You are responsible for the fact that you have to deal with your mind. That's there. But if you don't act on them, don't speak about them, or don't you perform them, then there's no reaction. But the downside, and this is where the important part of this whole discussion starts to come, if you allow negative thoughts to stay in your mind, they grow. And if they grow, they get stronger. If they get stronger, they pull on the senses where they are looking for some outlet. So the idea is, yes, okay, there's a special benefit. I can, if something negative, something sinful comes into the mind, something impious, I don't get a reaction for that. But at the same time, you should not allow these things to remain in the mind because they pollute the consciousness and can grow into something ugly. So therefore, one should be diligent in ridding the mind of these things as soon as they come in. Because as soon as any wrong thought comes in, say, say we start finding fault with someone in the mind, then one should think, oh, this is not right. Why should I find fault with this person? And then you immediately recognize it, and then you replace it with a good thought, and you start thinking the good qualities of that person rather than the so-called faults that the mind has conjured up. So this is how we can save ourselves from being degraded and keep always keep the mind always in a night in a pristine mood. The mind is a separate living entity, practically the same. Although it's our mind, it acts independently. We had the idea to control the mind means to redirect the mind towards Krishna or towards something beneficial. For instance, there is a beneficial way to control the mind on the material level, and that is to do good for others. You know, people give in charity, open up hospitals, you know, clothe the needy, feed the poor, and do things like that. That is continued to be materially beneficial. And so, but for a devotee, we're not interested so much in that. I'm using that as an ex example of how to change the mind from something uh, negative to something beneficial, positive. But we as devotees, we try to put Krishna in the mind. We think, chant, of the, chant the holy names of the Lord. We remember the Lord. We uh, engage in devotional service. When the mind is fully engaged in devotional service, it is controlled. And even if somehow the mind uh, is attacked by something negative, then one can easily rid the mind within a second or two. But sometimes devotees like to think of something negative just to analyze it and try to understand it, but best to remove that, the, that type of program because it will degrade one, just like we see. And this is a fact that there are people who are called do-gooders in the world. They're always seeking out evil to try to expose it or destroy it in some way or other. But because they focus on that, their consciousness also becomes like that to, a certain, to a, a certain degree, and sometimes even to a large degree. So when you focus on negativity, you become like what you focus on. You focus on Krishna, you purify your consciousness, and then Krishna appears within your mind. And then the mind is um, aligned with the, with the desire of the soul. And that is That is success. This verse is very interesting. And we find that one can commit activities even unwillingly when one and says that, what is that verse? Uh, it's somewhere, yeah, it's our June in the third chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, what causes the a person to act sinfully even against their own will? And of course, Krishna answers that it's lust and lust only coming in contact with the material modes of passion. 
later trans into raft, transforms into raft, which is the all devouring sinful enemy of this world. So we see how when Krishna is explaining that this, uh, this unwilling form of uh, uh, activity forces one into a sinful reaction. Why? Because we have a desire to enjoy the material energy. So if we don't act on that desire, and that's the first part, and redirect our consciousness to Krishna, to something spiritual, then uh, we are protected and we are in a position to make spiritual advancement. So that's very, very important because the mind is the closest thing to us outside of the soul. The soul is closer. The soul is us, but within relationship to the body, the mind is the closest thing to us, even more so than our physical body. So we have to keep that mind always moving in the right direction. Otherwise, it will pick up the effects of Kali Yuga, even if you don't want it. And what happens then you become implicated in an activity. So this concession teaches us, as soon as these thoughts come into the mind, become very diligent to remove them immediately and then replace them with Krishna consciousness or thoughts of for the benefit of others, for the benefit of the Lord, for the benefit of the Lord's devotees. This is an interesting verse. Uh, it says the, the reference is that the uh, Maharaj Parikshit could see that Kali was about to perform so many sinful activities. In order to prevent him from doing that, he stopped him. Therefore, he was to show his concern that Kali would suffer more and more simply by his activities. He restricted him. So he benefited him through restricting him. Where by not restricting him, he, he would be negligent in his duty and the, the personality of Kali would have been implicated more and more in the reactions of sinful activities. We see that in the family also, that if the, the parents fail to discipline the children, then the children may find themselves acting in the wrong way or even the sinful way, and the reaction comes. Mm -hmm. The reaction comes. So one has to be very much aware that the mind can any time pick up something wrong, something bad, something sinful, something impious, and then start to dwell on that and then gradually. But there's no reaction for the immediate thought, but the, an intelligent person will think, oh, my mind is going in the wrong direction. Let me bring it to Krishna, to devotional service. Okay, so I'll stop here. Any questions or comments? Thank you, Maharaj, for the explanation on these words. Thank you so much. Uh, devotees, please, uh, if there are any questions, comments, reflections, please go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Srila Prabhupada Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, Hare Krishna. I have a question. I think it's clarified, but I just want to clarify it a little bit more for my understanding. When, you, when it is described that the good thoughts manifest, even though they are not physically performed. So if we think good for, that can be materially or spiritually, or it can be? Both. Both. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And it doesn't make a distinction. Any good thoughts has a particular, uh, uh, it push, it, 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 it moves in the energy in a certain direction and then one gets the, the result and that is there's some, there's benefit for those who think in a pious way, in a spiritual way. Thank you, Maharaj. I think this is wonderful because then our prayers then needs to be more intense as well <laughs> when we do it for the devotees and because... Yeah, that's particularly sure. The intensity will also facilitate greater and greater benefit. Yeah, for sure. That's how it works. And that's a special concession in this age. I think it's, it's quite important to contemplate because imagine what kind of sinful reactions we would get if the other rules of the other age were applied, where even by thinking you get the reactions. Yeah. Mm. We're saved. <laughs> yes. Um, gradually going down because as I mentioned and you should take note of this is that this age is so permeated the atmosphere with wrong thoughts bad thoughts useless thoughts sinful thoughts people are generally unhappy and if they're not unhappy they're angry <laughs> they're angry because they can't fulfill their desires Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare uh, Krishna. Well, Maharaj, there is a question from Dheeraj Prabhuji in the chat. Uh, he's asking, how do I control the offensive thoughts which are disturbing my sadhana a lot? Actually, I don't even have an idea to think like that. But when I forcefully suppress them, they multiply. During chanting, sometimes I get negative thoughts. Krishna talks about that. He, ta he talks about that in relation to the controlling the mind. And he uses the example of riding on a horse. He said, when you're riding on a horse and you're trying to direct the horse in a certain direction, if you pull heavily on the reins, the horse will jump and buck. But if you gradually move the reins of the horse in the direction you want the horse to go in, you're more, you will be more likely to become successful. So if you jam the mind, force it, it will, it can also spring back and react in that way. So there's an art to that. You have to see where it's going and then gradually move it to where you want it to go. Forcing will cause it to rebel most of the time. Okay. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. If you go to the 12, the 20, I think it's chapter number 20 in the 11th canto, Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna talks about using the, the analogy of riding on a horse and controlling the mind. Okay, Guru Anyone else have any questions? Comments? Go ahead, Mataji, please. Please accept my humble obeisance. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Guru Maharaj. Are you uh, sick? No, no, no. I just look terrible. <laughs> no, no. I mean, uh, you, you look like you're a little under the weather. 
little bit because I'm really tired and exhausted with the travel and move and everything. But otherwise, I'm okay. Not to worry. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, I'm sorry for my appearance. Maybe I should shut off my camera. Everybody will be shivering out there looking at me. No, it's, it, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> Um, Guru Maharaj, you mentioned that um, um, desires, feelings come from the heart and then they influence the mind. So I was wondering whether there's some kind of reciprocal feedback loop, you know, our feelings drive our thoughts, then our thoughts drive our feelings and so on. So is there some way we can break that cycle so that it's not like a negative feedback loop? all the time. Mm. Okay. I missed a couple words in there, I think. When you were, you were the first, at the first you were beginning to explain your point. Okay. I, I was remembering that in the lecture, you said that the feelings and desires yeah. from the heart influence the mind. Yeah, and well, then, that's true because the soul is situated within that area of the heart, the region of the heart. So that's where all desires come. So then our desires influence and formulate our thoughts and they can be negative or positive, but they in turn have an influence on our feelings. So yeah. I was thinking, is there a negative feedback loop which can be interrupted so that we don't, we are not, carried away by our thoughts or feelings either. Uh, well, it's just a matter of replacing them with those type of thoughts and feelings that are beneficial. You know, don't allow things that are useless or, or sinful or inauspicious to, to enter into the mind, that's all. When they enter in, you just replace them. That's all. Or, you know, Chris Prabhupada says you have to learn how to neglect your mind. Neglecting those things that you, you that you see are not beneficial or sinful. And replacing them with Krishna conscious thoughts. That's one. It's about the, the process is Krishna consciousness. That means consciousness of Krishna. Consciousness of, of the service to Krishna. So then if we try to focus the mind on Krishna and Krishna's service, automatically mm -hmm. other extraneous negative thoughts are at bay and they don't, they're not allowed to torment us. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, you have to practice that because the mind doesn't usually give up these, these thoughts so easily. It's right. A it's a continual practice. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Can I ask you a question? Yes, please, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, can you finish that those last couple of days on the month of June that are still lingering yet? I think it's just June 5th, 6th, and 7th. Yes, Guru year. Maharaj. I, today, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm very much aware of that. And I was going to do that today itself. Okay, I hope it doesn't put a strain on your on your uh, eyes. If you well, find my it, eyes are, <laughs> you know, no matter what I do, the the burning sensation continues. So I might as well do it and finish that part off. I think when I finally get to Slovenia, I can actually do all that treatment, Guru Maharaj. It's not a problem. I can do it. All right. Well, you know, I well, I'm not going. Don't want to at all cause you any added, you know. Problem. So if you find you can't do it, then just uh, mm. wait. Then I'll try. I'll try my best to do it, Grimara. Don't worry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Please, accept my, please accept my humble obeisances. Uh, all glory is to Shri Prabhupada. Uh, so, Maharaj, my question was, uh, the offense uh, 
can be created through my body mind or speech so uh, i i understand uh, about the speech but i am um, can you uh, elaborate or give some example on offense through body and mind um yeah i can tell you a past time which illustrates that okay okay this was uh, the sages were meeting together in the higher realms and the heavenly planets and they were trying to understand who is the actual supreme lord is it lord brahma lord shiva or lord vishnu so in order to you know come to the answer they decided to make an experiment experiment so they asked brigo muni brigo muni is the son of lord brahma the brother of lord shiva to um go and uh, find out who is the actual supreme is it brahma shiva vishnu and so he first went to shatya loka brahma loka to his father now it's the etiquette that when the son comes into the presence of the father he offers obeisances to the father that is the etiquette but he came in and didn't offer obeisances brahma greeted his son and um brigo didn't really respond to his greeting at all so he committed an offense within the mind mm -hmm. Brahma became angry and as soon as Brahma became angry and Brigu left and he went on to uh Kailash or Shiva Loka and then he met Lord Shiva there and Lord Shiva was with Parvati and they were together and and Brigu comes in now Brigu is his brother Shiva says oh my dear brother you've come and he gets up to greet him and when he's going to embrace him uh brigo says no no you don't touch me you associating with you know uh, lower creatures you have all ashes all over your body snakes don't touch me now shiva got very angry he was about to kill his brother brigo but parvati she checked him and shiva became pacified because of parvati but brigo noted oh shiva has become angry so that offense by brigo was by speech the first one was in the mind the second one was by speech and then he went to to uh, swetadweep the island in the material world where the lord stays in his vishnu form so he came and the lord was there on the ocean of milk that's where the ocean of milk is in swetadweep and he was with his consort lakshmi devi he came soon as the, the lord saw him he immediately got up to to uh, greet uh brigo he said oh my dear brigo so not happy to come you come please now brigo didn't say anything he just walked right up to vishnu and kicked him in the chest <laughs> now vishnu immediately responded by oh my dear brigo you know i am a shatri and my chest is very hard so i'm sure your foot must be injured so let me let me massage your foot so then of course brigo understood that this was the supreme lord and you can see that past time is illustrated if you see deities of lord jagannath not all of them but some of them they have a a little footmark on their chest right near their arm on the inner side and that's the mark of brigu the lord wears that as an emblem an ornament so the first offense was in the mind the second was in words and the third was of the most the corporal of all offenses by body so these are the three ways offenses can be uh, performed each one is more severe okay so the yeah. offense created yeah, no. in the mind uh, yeah please continue maharaj i just wanted to add one thing that's lakshmi became very angry 
when Brigo did that to Vishnu. And she cursed that the Brahmins would never be rich. And so that, that's why they say Brahmins are poor because of the curse of Lakshmi. <laughs> Okay, so uh, you said the people of Kali Yuga, they, uh, when they create offense through mind, uh, it is not that much considered uh, in comparison to the other Yugas. So, uh, is it, does it apply in this age also? This is Kali Yuga. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah, we're, in, uh, we're in Kali Yuga. Okay, so the offenses uh, created by mind is not applied, actually, or no, no, it's not. But if you, like I said, there's a danger if you allow them to stay in the mind, they can grow and turn into an active offense, either speaking or acting. So the idea right. is not to not to allow them, but. You don't get any reactions for the thought. Mm -hmm. Okay, Maharaj. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the example. Yeah, that's if you just read that verse, you'll see how it's clearly explained. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Hey, Krishna. <laughs> hey, Krishna. What is, what is, are there any more questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Um, sometimes offensive thoughts or negative thoughts, they come very temporarily. And very... Very, very yeah, very in a very temporary manner, and they are not even related anywhere to our regular life. Um, I would not even say offensive thoughts, but sometimes negative thoughts they just come from any aspect of the life which is not necessarily related to our to our present life or not necessarily related to something that is currently happening with us. So why do those type of thoughts, they come? Well, two reasons. One, it's the age of Kali and the whole atmosphere is polluted. And so you get affected by the atmosphere. And the second one is that they, the unconscious mind can also uh, reveal to the conscious level certain things that are there within the unconscious. Unconscious means we're not aware of them, but they are there. But that happens also. Could come from the internal, it can come from the external. You know, just like in dreams, you don't, you know, you don't expect a dream in the way you do sometimes. And you do have a dream and there's no connection with anything you're doing on the outside. But it's coming from the unconscious part of the mind. And the unconscious part of the mind is the composite of all of our activities in all of our previous lives. It's there in a, in, a, in a dormant stage. So it could come from either one of the two. So shall we just ignore them? Yeah, or try completely, to... completely just throw them out. <laughs> The thing is, soon as you, the more you ignore them, the more they come. Their, the power that they have over you becomes less, and finally they don't appear anymore because they're just shadows. They're nothing. There's no reality to them. They're mental creations. That's all. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, just ignore them. Ignore them and replace them with something devotional. Mm. 
You can think of Krishna anytime. <laughs> there's no there's no restrictions. You can anytime you can think of Krishna. Just like right now, just think of Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> And you're right there. <laughs> He's there. And that thought. <laughs> yes, I just had a dream today. And I remember having such a dream a few years ago. And I was just bewildered. I was um, going for a service in the morning and I was just praying to Krishna that I thought that I was done with these kind of dreams and on my unconscious level also probably they are gone because they didn't come for so many years and suddenly again um, a bad dream came where I was in action and doing something which I would not do normally. Yeah, it happens. That could be something coming from the outside. It's hard to say where it's coming from, but... You can more or less evaluate that better than anyone else. You can see your situation that you're presently in and see if it, that thought has any connection with what you're doing or what you're thinking at the time. I just think they, are, they all come from the Bollywood movies that I have seen in my young age. Yes, there you go. <laughs> But then sometimes I think that we have seen so many things in the Bollywood movies, but why do these violent kind of, kind of scenes always come in front of me? I think I've mentioned this to you before. Can also be, they can also be due to, to eating foodstuffs prepared by people who are not devotees. And then you also get that. You get their consciousness that comes through the food. The food is a transmission into the consciousness, particularly grains. That's why Prabhupada writes, one should not eat food grains cooked by non-devotees. So you don't know what their consciousness is and then all of a sudden you're, you're in that same consciousness. That's one way, if you're not doing that, then you have to think, well, Maybe it's, yeah, maybe it is a Bollywood movie. <laughs> yes, because outside food we eat nearly, we eat very less. I mean, I do still eat, but very, very less. So the first thing that comes to my mind is these Bollywood movies. That's probably it. <laughs> and it's been 15, 16 years since I have left seeing those movies, Maharaj. But when I still get the glimpses, even though it's in rare cases, I, my faith in Krishna's words become firm. Mm. That when when, to, an, um, inc how when an incident, when a thought has an emotional attachment to it, it becomes stronger. Like anger, anger is an emotion that is very strong. And uh, love, affection, these are strong emotions. So when you attach a particular theme to that, it has a stronger impression on the mind. And even though it may leave, it may also reappear. Yes, um, I think I have mentioned this to you in one of the classes before, Maharaj, that I really get very much affected when I see somebody physically suffering. Mm. I have a sensitivity and I remember as a teenage girl, I have, I have watched, I watched a movie where I saw violence. And after I came out of that movie, I told my friends and I came home and I told my mother as well that I don't know what effect this movie has done on me. I feel I should never watch a violent movie. Yeah, Prabhupada also said that he's sitting on planes and he sometimes... He looks up at the screen and he sees these things. He says, yes, they leave impressions in our mind. Mm. Especially the movies, because they deal with the intensity of emotions in order to bring about, you know, that connection to what they're showing you. A lot of emotion. And violence is violence. 
is very, very strong in media, very strong. That's all you see practically. Yeah, stay away from that. That's all. That's all you can do. I've been staying away and it has still not left me. <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll reduce it will take time. time, right? Yeah. But keep, and you can re-fortify your mind with thoughts of Krishna, mm. thoughts of devotional service. Mm. And yes. Then, they get weaker and weaker, the other thought. Sure. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay. Runda, are you still with yes. us? Yes, Maharaj. <laughs> okay. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. I'm sorry. Uh, 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 can I ask a follow-up question from Mansin Mataji? Yeah, we're still here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, so it, it is just a follow-up question that um, maybe some people are having uh, the whole family as a devotee family, but uh, yeah. some devotees stays with uh, non-devotees. Well, well, not I, I would not use this word non-devotee, but rather who are not practicing Krishna consciousness. So uh, when a, uh, a person practicing Krishna consciousness don't want to see those, uh, you know, Bollywood things, but uh, you cannot stop other people around. So how should the person restrict uh, those influences? They should, you know, in other words, you're living with someone and they're living, they're doing something that is not good and it's affecting you. So how do you restrict those effects? Is that it? Yes. Like we cannot stop other people in family watching those movies or, you know, those, um, you know, uh, very emotion, highly emotional things. Well, I don't know. I'm a little bit more radical than most people. I wouldn't stay around there. <laughs> I wouldn't allow that to go on. <laughs> but if you can't get away from it, you know, you have to just make sure that you're not around when they're somehow or other doing these things. It's just as soon as they start you know, picking up the media on that, just immediately excuse yourself. Yeah, you don't want to be around that. It doesn't help, doesn't help them, it doesn't help you. It's just... Yes, and you know, you can, you, can get a, you can get a thought in your mind that's so emotionally strong and so negative that you can't get it out for years <laughs> it's that's yes, yeah so we don't want to yeah. we don't want we don't want to jump as our krishna consciousness yes maharaj I'm, i i do um i do restrict myself i mean at least now i can't uh, really see or uh you know the tolerate even those kind of uh you know plays or music so I just walk away, but then uh, the family, they say that, why are you being so hard on yourself? Well, they don't know any better. Just don't listen to them. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, they don't, listen to, they don't know what's right. They don't know what's right for you. They don't know what's right for themselves. And this is the nature of the world. People, are, people don't think, you know, enjoying the senses, is the goal of life. We say restricting the senses and engaging the senses towards Krishna is the goal of life. They, oh, they just, okay, Maharaj, that they clarifies. Yeah, yeah. They don't, they have no, our value system is different than theirs. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Aribo. Jai Ho. So we can we can stop here. Okay. Okay, Maharaj. Thank you so much for today's class, Maharaj. Thank you. For okay. You. I am Thank you. All glories to Shri Lakshmi. So Prabhupada much. will be back tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow is Saturday, I think, yeah. And then Sunday we have a special class at 1.20 UK, no, 12.20, I'm sorry, 12.20 UK time on the appearance of Lord Balaram. Thank you so much, Maharaj, once again. Thank you. Hare Krishna, my obeisances to all the devotees. Panchi Kalpati, Nishjaki, 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 Thank you very much. All glories to the Sambhu devotees. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much for your mercy and your compassion on all of us. Arivo, Arivo. Dear Prashanta, Arivo. Hare Krishna. Okay, we'll 